So, uh, very good afternoon to you all. Uh, Dr. Farnsworth is back, and I could see uh, the participants who were there. They're still there. A few left, and they're yet to join. But I hope they will join very soon. So, we can just, uh, uh, if Dr. Farnsworth feels like, we can just start. All right. Thank you very much for that. Uh, hello again, everyone, and thanks for coming back. So, uh, this is going to be my third lecture. Um, in my first two lectures, I focused on Dinkin diagrams and their applications, well, really their, their use in finding subalgebras. And so the last two lectures were, were fairly mathematical. And for my final lecture, I want to do something that's uh, entirely physical. And I want to discuss uh, grain unified theories because this is uh, one of the uh, places in physics where you have to search around for uh, subgroups and subalgebras. Um, and so uh, this should fit in nicely with the, the preceding two uh, lectures, but be much more uh, physics based. All right, so uh, that being said, uh, what is a grand unified theory? Um, a grand unified theory is a way of organizing uh, the particle content of, of a, of a uh, field theory in, in a nice way, right? So, um, Oh, I, I should say, um, so I'm going to be talking about uh, field theory and, and, and particle theory, and I, I realize most people, perhaps uh, many people in, in the audience will not have uh, a background in, in standard model physics or, or in uh, field theory. And so the, the discussion I'm going to give uh, is going to be uh, somewhat of a cartoon. It's going to be an overview uh, to give you a flavor for grand unified theories and, and for particle theory. Uh, and, and then if you find it interesting, you should have enough tools to, to look into some of these uh, ideas uh, on your own uh, subsequently. But, but in any case, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about uh, grand unified theories. And, and the reason why, why people are interested in grand unified theories is because they clean up uh, some problems that arise uh, in the standard model of particle physics. So the standard model of particle physics uh, is our best uh, theory of nature. It, it gives our, our best description of all the particles that we see in experiment uh, together with their interactions uh, and, and dynamics. And it, it turns out that if, if you look at the particle content that we see in experiment, it, it, it sort of, it, it's kind of messy. Right? There's, there's all different types of particles um, uh, and, and uh, strange forces under which they in interact. And we don't really have any explanation for why it is that we see the particles that we see and the representations uh, that we see. And so grand unified uh, theories uh, are an attempt to explain why it is that we see the particles that we see um, uh, in experiment. Right. So let me begin by, by telling you a little bit about the standard model of particle physics and, and why it is that I say it's messy. So uh, in, the, in the table here I have on screen, this is a tabulation of all the, the particle content of the standard model of particle physics. And the standard model of particle physics is a gauge theory. Shil, uh, you haven't started the presentation. I haven't? Oh, uh, my apologies. <laughs> but you could hear me, right? Yeah, yeah, you are audible. Okay, so you haven't you haven't missed <laughs> anything. Uh, uh, I've just been sitting on this slide, so you haven't missed anything. So let me start uh, with a brief introduction to the standard model of particle physics, uh, and, and sort of explain to you why I say it's messy. And uh, so the, the standard model of particle physics is a gauge theory, and that means all the fields in in the model. Uh, sit in representations uh, under some local uh, gauge group, right? So the, the, the gauge symmetries of the standard model are SU3 cross SU2 uh, cross U1, right? And uh, so the SU3 is associated with the strong force, SU2 is associated with the weak force, and U1 is associated with weak hypercharge. Right? And then what this table does is it tabulates uh, all of the matter content and, and the representations that they sit in underneath this gauge group. Right? So to start with, we have fermions, and there are two types of fermions. There's the quarks, right? Q left here, Q right, down right. 
and they sit as triplets underneath SU3. Right? This means they're charged under the strong force. Then there are leptons. Right? These, uh, uh, for example, the right-handed neutrino and, and, and the right-handed electron. These sit as singlets underneath SU3. They're uncharged underneath SU3. Now, the fermions come in two different chiralities. There's left-handed chiralities, uh, particles, sorry, and right-handed uh, fermions. And in the standard model, it turns out the standard model is chiral. Uh, and what that means is only the left-handed particles uh, sit in uh, non-trivial representations underneath SU2. Right? So the left-handed particles all sit in as doublets underneath SU2, whereas all the right-handed particles uh, sit as singlets under underneath SU2, which means they're uncharged underneath the weak force. And in the final column here, I've listed all of the uh, hypercharges. I'm not, I'm not so sure if you've seen uh, a tabulation like this before, um, but what you'll notice is these numbers appear at first glance to... Latam, Latam has discussed these tables quite extensively anyway. It's no harm in going to a game. Okay, excellent, excellent. Well, I'm, I'm not going to be saying too much on this. The only thing I wanted to point out is that uh, this tabulation, at first, at first glance, it, it, it might uh, seem quite random. The, the uh, representations and charges, uh, where do they come from? Okay, um, and in fact, there's very little uh, restriction on these uh, on these uh, representations coming from group theory. Oh, I, I think, Bishwat, you've left your microphone on. Are, are you able to um, uh, mute that? Oh, thank, thank you very much. Um, there are some restrictions on these hypercharges coming from what's known as anomaly cancellation, but for the most part, there's no real reason coming from group theory that these particles should take the representations uh, that they do. Okay, and, 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 and so, you know, you might find this table quite confusing, um, and that's okay because uh, many other physicists don't really understand, no, no physicists understand uh, where these numbers are really coming from. It's just what they observe in experiment. Okay, so grand unified theories are an attempt to answer the question of, of where this particle content comes from. Okay. So the idea behind a grand unified theory is that you have some, some more fundamental theory with some large gauge group, right? some larger gauge group, and that this SU3, SU2, U1 is just a subgroup of that larger group. Right? So the idea is that in, in the early universe, uh, where everything's nice and hot, uh, you have this larger symmetry group, and as the, the universe cools down, uh, the symmetry breaks into some uh, the symmetry group that we see in experiment, and at the same time, the various representations under the large group, they also break down into smaller representations, right? these shards that we see after symmetry breaking. And, and so this is, this is the explanation for why we see uh, this particular breakup of, uh, of fields right? in, in, in the framework of grand unified theories. So this is what I want to explain to you today. And I'm going to explain to you uh, how this happens uh, through example. So, so to start with, I'm going to explain to you what the Higgs mechanism is. This is a mechanism uh, which, which uh, does symmetry breaking for you. And after I've explained uh, in sort of schematic form uh, what the Higgs mechanism is, I'm then, then going to give the example of SU5 grand unification and show you uh, with explicit representations uh, how, how the SU5 grand unified theory breaks down to the standard model uh, of particle physics. Okay. So. I'm going to start with uh, what's known as the Higgs mechanism. And uh, I'm, I'm not going to uh, be doing this as a standard model because the standard model is too complicated. Uh, instead, I'm going to just look at a subset of the particles. So I'm going to focus on just the leptons and throw away the right-handed neutrinos. I'm going to focus on a single generation of particles. The standard model has three generations of particles. And I'm going to throw away the strong force. So I'm going to just consider this electroweak model. Okay. Now, uh, in, in this particle theory, right, this is like a simplified version of the standard model, where we have uh, just a subset of the particle content. We, th this tabulation lists what the particle con content is, but then we need to also describe the dynamics. Right? So usually for a, for a field theory, you describe the dynamics in terms of a Lagrangian. Right? So 
Here I've written down a Lagrangian for this, this set of particle content. Right? And don't worry if you don't understand what this, this means. Uh, that's not important for understanding the, the remainder of, of what I'm going to be discussing. All that you need to know is that these, these terms here are kinetic terms, which describe the, the kinetics of the gauge bosons. Right? The gauge bosons are the force mediating particles that mediate uh, SU2 uh, cross U1 in this case. And these second terms are uh, kinetic terms for the leptons. Right? They describe the kinetics uh, of, of the leptons. Right? So as I said, you don't need to understand uh, directly uh, the form of, of, of this expression. I just want to point out uh, one particular uh, important thing, and that is I haven't included any mass terms. So uh, in, in the real world, we, we see leptons in experiment, and we see that they have the symmetry uh, SU2 cross U1, but we also see that they have mass. And so uh, it would be a good idea to add mass terms into our Lagrangian. Um, and usually uh, a mass term, the form that it takes is you couple a left-handed field to a right-handed field. That's the form that uh, mass, mass terms take for fermions. So we want to add uh, terms of this form into our Lagrangian, describing the dynamics of our, of our toy model here. But if we try to do this, we run into an interesting problem. If you have a look at the form that these mass terms take, right, this left-handed lepton sits in a doublet. Right? Secretly, it has a doublet index, whereas the right-handed particles uh, transform as singlets underneath SU2. So in this expression, we have a doublet field and a singlet field underneath SU2. And so this, this object here is a two-component object. And that's problematic because we don't want our Lagrangian to be a two-component object. Right? We ultimately uh, use our Lagrangian to construct an action like an energy equation, and we know uh, energy is not a two-component object. And, and so it appears that it's inconsistent to write down uh, mass terms in, in the usual way. And, and so we, we, run in, we run run into a confusing detail uh, because this model is chiral. Right? Because the left-handed fields uh, appear differently to the right-handed fields, right? because they, they transform differently underneath the symmetries, it, it appears that we can't write down uh, mass terms because mass terms couple these, these uh, fields together. Right? And, and we end up with uncontracted indices. Okay. Um, and, and that's problematic because, you know, we, we know from experiment that we, we, we see these symmetries, we see these chiral symmetries, and we also know from experiment that particles have mass. So what do we do? So Higgs had a solution to this problem. Uh, Higgs suggested, and, and several other people suggested, how about we introduce a new field, uh, H, right? uh, a, a scalar field which is also a doublet. Right? And then we can add uh, dynamic terms into our Lagrangian for this additional field. So these are kinetic terms for the Higgs. You don't really need to worry too much about their form. Maybe the Higgs has a potential. Uh, but importantly, we can add uh, coupling terms between the Higgs and the fermions and these look suspiciously similar to mass terms. Right? The form of the coupling between a Higgs term and the fermions looks suspiciously similar to the mass terms. But you can consistently write down these in terms of this form. Right? The idea is you introduce a Higgs field which also sits in a doublet representation of SU2. Right? And the SU2 index on the Higgs contracts with the SU2 index uh, on, on the uh, left-handed doublet, ensuring that this is uh, a one-component object. Right? So your Lagrangian at the end of the day uh, can be used to construct a, a scalar. So, so you can consistently write terms down like this, and they look a lot like mass terms. Uh, the problem is that this, this uh, Higgs here and this uh, coupling uh, aren't exactly like a mass term, right? Because the Higgs is a field. It, it varies across uh, space and time. But if it happened to be the case, if it happened to be the case that the Higgs became fixed at some value, let's call it a vacuum expectation value, some, some fixed value, then this term would act very much like a mass term. In fact, that's exactly what happens in the Higgs mechanism. And this is 
uh, why people say that the Higgs gives mass to the other particles. Okay. So uh, here, here's how the Higgs mechanism works uh, schematically. So, uh, so we have our, our, our Lagrangian terms, right, for our Higgs. Right? We add these terms in uh, to our original Lagrangian. So now our uh, particle content includes all of this content here plus a Higgs field. And our dynamics include all of these terms here uh, plus the terms for our Higgs dynamics. And here we have a potential for the Higgs. So if the Higgs potential takes the following form, right, this, this is uh, called the Mexican hat potential. This is uh, what people call uh, this potential colloquially. Um, then it will take the following form. Right? Right, so th this potential only depends uh, on the absolute value or the norm of, of H. And so we can, we can plot uh, the potential. I, I've plotted it here in, in one dimensions, but you should remember that the the Higgs is a two-component complex object, and so it it, it, uh, it has it exists in some, some sort of uh, multi-dimensional field space, which I've tried to indicate here by these dotted lines. But you, you can see the form that the potential takes. It takes sort of this Mexican hat-shaped potential. Okay, and so the idea is the following: in the early universe, when, when everything is hot, the kinetic terms. Uh, dominate in the Lagrangian. Right? So when, when particles are zipping around at high energies, these, these kinetic terms for the Higgs dominate, and the, the, the potential is less important. But as the, the, the temperature cools down, uh, this potential begins to dominate, and in particular, you see that the minimum of the potential doesn't sit at zero, it sits at some non-zero value right, for the Higgs. Right? So this this is so for for um, for uh, at very low temperatures. This is the preferred value that the Higgs likes to take. It sort of rolls down this potential, right? and and it wants to take the, the lowest possible energy state. So, unlike most potentials, which would be sort of uh, zero at the origin, this this potential has a, a non-zero uh, uh, vacuum expectation value. So the, the, what you say is, is the Higgs, uh, when it's when it's not, um, uh, it's it's in its lowest energy state. It likes to sit here at the bottom of this potential. Okay, so schematically, what the picture is is if you if you have a look at this uh, potential, right, uh, it's invariant underneath the symmetries of of SU two. Right, so under SU two, the Higgs field uh, transforms. Uh, in the following way, right, where these alphas are coefficients uh, of our, for our SU2 transformation, and, and uh, this uh, component here corresponds to some U1 transformation. And this is how our Higgs field transforms under SU2 across U1. And this potential, because it only depends on the norm of the, of the uh, Higgs field, uh, is invariant underneath these transformations. But notice that if the Higgs takes uh, some vacuum expectation value, if it rolls down this potential and takes some non-zero uh, value, which we can write uh, without loss of generality in, in the following form, then only a subset of the gauge symmetries will leave uh, this form invariant. So without loss of generality, if, if the Higgs takes some vacuum expectation value around which it fluctuates, then only a subset of, of the gauge transformations will leave the form of this uh, VEV invariant. And in particular, you, you, can, you can see from, from the form of, of, uh, of, of uh, the gauge transformations, the only gauge transformations where the coefficients alpha equals uh, alpha one equals alpha two equals zero, and in which uh, alpha three equals beta, only these combinations uh, uh, will result in uh, gauge transformations which leave this VEV in, in invariant. Okay? And so what you see is once the Higgs field picks up uh, an expectation value, it breaks the SU3 cross U1 symmetry down to a U1 symmetry. Right? You can see that it's U1 because there are uh, four coefficients here and uh, three of them become constrained, leaving just uh, one uh, generator free. 
So that's that's the basic idea. So 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 we introduce uh, some uh, Higgs field which has a particular potential, uh, which under which uh, forces the field to go uh, undergo symmetry breaking. It takes a non-zero. So uh, I, I said that the Higgs field gives mass to particles. So let's have a look at how that uh, occurs. So I'm going to look at the gauge bosons, uh, but an analogous, uh, uh, yes? Uh, in the ground state, I have two values for minimum potential, right? Uh, you've actually got a whole range of this. This this potential isn't really one dimensional. It's in in it, you should view this as a potential in field space. So in fact, uh, V could the the potential can take okay, any. I, I have one field in the ground state, right? Uh, sorry, say that again. I, I mean, I, I could have taken any point uh, in the ground state. I have E one. E1 symmetry left, right? I yes. can, I could take any points from. That's correct. Then That's how correct. does this decoherence, decoherence come? I mean, why not ground state is the linear superposition of all these states? Uh, I I am choosing on ground state is just at one point, right? And mm -hmm. then my Fox space is built up. Why the decoherence? Why this point? I mean, there is no way to taking one point, and why I am not considering the linear superposition of all the points as the ground state? Okay. Um, so the idea is is so first of all, uh, it, to describe the Higgs uh, Higgs mechanism, really you should be dealing uh, quantum mechanically. But I'm, I'm being a little bit, just for, for lack of time here, I'm being a little bit naughty. And I'm sort of describing things uh, as though these are sort of classical fields. But, um, but the same idea sort of uh, passes. Um, the idea is that I, in space-time, I, um, I have some field, some Higgs field that exists throughout space-time. And at any point in, in, in space-time, the Higgs can take some value. And, and in particular, this Higgs could, you know, at one point in space time, you, you could take some vacuum expectation value that appears, you know, uh, at one point, and then somewhere else in, in space time, the vacuum expectation could be um, at some other, you know, position in 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 the uh, in the in the um, in in the uh, um, you know, you, you could you could you could have, for example, uh, the Higgs taking this value over here on this side of the potential, or any way around here in, in the field space. Okay, but the important the po importance is that Higgs will take a, um, a vacuum expectation smoothly between points, right? And at any location, uh, it, it, it'll take uh, one of these values here. That, that's the point. So the the point is is the Higgs sort of rolls down this potential and picks up a non 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 zero value at, at any point in space. Okay, and the non non zero uh, expectation value means that I have some kind of charge in my ground state running, right? So so what it means is it's more energetically favorable. To produce uh, Higgs fields, essentially. So, so usually you would have a potential that zero, uh, at, at, you know, at its minimum is at the zero, and then your your fields would sort of oscillate, uh, you know, at the potential here, right? So, so here, um, it it's energetically favorable to have the Higgs field taking on a non-zero value, and so the, the the field likes to sort of oscillate over here. Uh, so so along this axis here. Is is sort of uh, the size of the Higgs field, the the norm of this this uh, field H over here, and at some value where H is at, at this value, in fact, uh, when 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 uh, the norm of the Higgs field uh, takes up this value, uh, is where you'll find the potential. So the so what happens is that the Higgs field takes some value, which without loss of generality I can write in this in this form, and it will oscillate. Uh, in small fluctuations about that point. That's that's the the picture I'm trying to convey.
Ok, ok, próximo. So, I, I mentioned uh, that the Higgs field is, is people say that it gives um, it gives particles mass, right? and and what I mean, is, I'll, I'll give some example. Uh, I'll, I'll I'll look at it specifically at the, the gauge bosons. Right? So if you look at the form of the uh, the uh, kinetic terms for the Higgs, right? they take the following form where this capital D is a covariant uh, derivative acting on, on the Higgs doubling. Right? So we can, so the covariant derivative, what it is, is it's the usual partial derivative plus some connection terms, right? And these, these terms are added in to ensure that the, uh, the derivative of H acts covariantly with respect to the gauge symmetries. Right? So here you can interpret B as a gauge field and the W, uh, I is contracted with the generators of SU2, you can view these also as, as, a, as a set of three uh, gauge bosons. Okay, so where the, these are I times your, your Pauli matrices. So in any case, if, if, our, if, our, covariant exterior, uh, if our covariant derivative uh, takes on this form, then we can write out this expression in, in the following way, where H uh, takes takes on its, uh, is fluctuating about its uh, vac vacuum expectation value. Right. Now, if we, if we take uh, this expression here and we substitute it into the form for the kinetic term, you, you'll of course get lots of terms, right? but you should focus on those terms uh, which are quadratic in V, right? because those terms will be of the following form. They will be some gauge boson squared with some, uh, you know, some v squared out the front. So th th these, these terms are exactly the form that a mass term would take uh, for these fields. Right? And so it, th this is a little bit uh, messy, th this explanation that I'm giving. I'm just trying to give a general uh, overview or feel for how, how this mechanism works. We can collect, if you, if you look inside uh, the uh, one one term here, or the two one term, or the one two terms, you'll see there are certain combinations that arise. If we collect together these combinations, right, what we'll find is, is when, when we express the action terms, uh, if we just write out these terms here, if we make these substitutions, I recommend you, you go ahead and actually uh, play around with this for yourselves. If, if you just take, take uh, this expression I've, I've shown you here, substitute it into these kinetic terms for the Higgs, then what you'll find is you'll find uh, mass terms for the following uh, combinations of generators. So you'll have the, this should be a minus, the W minus boson, the W plus boson, what's called the Z boson, and you'll have the photon, right? And they'll, they'll all have the following uh, mass terms. So you'll find that the, the photon remains massless, whereas the W and Z bosons uh, pick up mass uh, via this mechanism. And uh, you can go through and, and you'll find an analogous uh, thing happens uh, for the other particles. So uh, after symmetry breaking, uh, these uh, Yukawa couplings here will turn into, you'll get sort of mass terms for the fermions for those here. And uh, similarly, from this potential, you'll find mass terms uh, for the Higgs field, where, where Higgs field is now this fluctuation around the, the vacuum. Okay, so that was a cartoon. Uh, uh, just so you can sort of understand that we do have a mechanism um, for breaking symmetries. And the question is, can we use uh, this mechanism to go from some, some gauge theory with some higher uh, symmetry, with some large symmetry group, can we, can we use the Higgs mechanism to break down uh, to the standard model gauge group, um, uh, thereby explaining all the representations that we find in, in the standard model? So what I, what I want to do now is give an example, uh, which is the Georgie Glashow SG5 model. And uh, the reason why this is interesting is it's the, this sort of the simplest uh, grand unified theory you can write down. Right? So what we want is we want uh, a, a model which has some gauge symmetry, which breaks down to the standard model gauge group. And if you look at the standard model gauge group, it's of rank four. So SU3 is, is rank 
2, SU2 is rank 1, and U1 is rank 1. So if we want to embed the standard model gauge group in some larger group, gauge group, it, it must be of rank 4 or higher. Now, the, the simplest rank 4 uh, 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 Lie algebra uh, that we can find, which contains the standard model gauge group, uh, is SU5. Right? And from our uh, previous two lectures, we can write down the Dinkin diagram for SU5, for the SU5 Lie algebra. And we can cross out one of the roots. And what we obtain is SU3 uh, across U, uh, SU2, and we get a U1 uh, from, from this crossed out root here. Right. So at least naively, it looks like we should be able to use the SU5 uh, gauge group uh, uh, to contain the, sta the standard model gauge group. But what we need to do next is, is we need to ensure that uh, we can actually find representations of SU5 that break down to nice uh, representations uh, uh, under the standard model gauge group. In other words, we want to find some representations that when the symmetry group breaks, break down into the representations that we see here. Okay. So, so let's see if we can find these uh, representations. And first of all, let's see if we can, we can actually uh, uh, get the breaking that we want using the Higgs mechanism. So, here, so SU5 is a rank for 24 dimensional uh, simple Lie algebra. It's written as a group. Um, and so there are 24 generators. Okay. Now, it's nice to write these generators out in a nice uh, basis so that you can see the SU3 plus SU2 plus U1 uh, subalgebra. And so the first eight generators I'm going to express in the following form. Right. I'm, going to, I'm going to write them in terms of these Gelman matrices written in the upper three by three uh, block. Right. So you, you can write out the adjoint representation as, as five by five matrices. And the first eight generators I'm going to express in terms of the Gelman matrices. Uh, the next three I'm going to write in terms of the Pauli matrices, where the Pauli matrices sit in this bottom uh, right two by two block. And I'm going to write, uh, express uh, T12 as a diagonal matrix which commutes with, with both of these. Right? So th those are the first 12 generators we can write down. Right? And it's very easy to see uh, that th these generators will form an SU3 plus SU2 plus U1 subalgebra. Right? These are the generators of SU3, these are the generators of SU2, and this is a U1, uh, the generator for U1. Right? But there are 24 uh, generators we need to construct. So where, how do we construct the remaining 24? Well, uh, here we've used up all of our degrees of freedom, essentially, in, in the, this bottom 2 by 2 and this uh, top 3 by 3. But we have these remaining uh, six elements here. Right? And any element we write down has to be anti-hermitian. And so uh, we, can, we can fill these six elements with either a real number or a, or a complex of the imaginary number. And so there's 12 more elements that we can write down. Right? I, a one here, one here, or I here, I here, and similarly for the remainder of these six elements. Right? So this is, this is a nice basis for constructing, uh, this is a nice basis for SU5. Okay, now, can we, so, so we have some, so we have some uh, SU5 gauge theory where the gauge bosons transform the adjoint representation of this theory. And the next question is, can we add in some scalar fields which can be used to break down the, uh, the SU5 symmetry to the uh, symmetry group of the standard model? And to that end, let's introduce a scalar field in the 24-dimensional adjoint representation uh, of uh, SU5. Right. So uh, under the adjoint representation, this 24, this adjoint, this, this uh, scalar field, which sits in the adjoint, will transform in the following way, where U here is uh, of the following form. So you can think of, of this, this field as a five by five matrix valued field uh, that exists throughout space time. Right? And, and under a local gauge transformation, it transforms in the following way. Right? 
So <clears throat> what we want to do is we want to see what happens when the, fig, the, when the Higgs takes on a VEV. So let's imagine this, this field has, has, a, has a, an appropriate potential, and uh, as the universe cools, this, this Higgs field takes on a VEV. In particular, let's imagine it takes on a VEV which is proportional to T12, right, to this uh, element here. Right. The question is, which of these symmetries, which of these transformations will leave this VEV invariant? We'll just, to, see, uh, to see which, which generators will leave uh, this VEV invariant, it's, it's a good idea to have a look uh, more closely at the form of the transformations of, of this uh, Higgs field. And you, you can see if you expand out these unitary elements uh, in a matrix expansion, uh, as the matrix expansion, so a series expansion rather, then you find that uh, the action of the uh, gauge generators uh, on, on uh, the Higgs field, it always comes as commutators. Right? So you're going to end up with uh, terms which are going to have nested commutators, right? If we go to higher and higher order, and so the generators that leave uh, the VEV invariant are those generators that commute with the VEV, right? They're, it's going to be those elements, those those algebra elements, uh, which commute uh, with with the VEV, because in in those cases all of these uh, additional terms will be zero, and the field will be left invariant. So in other words. Only those generators which commute with the VEV, which is proportional to th this term here, uh, will leave uh, the VEV invariant. And it happens to be, this happens to be exactly these 12 generators here. It's clear uh, that these three generators will commute with these diagonal uh, elements here, whereas these remaining generators will not. So what happens is, uh, as the universe cools, you go through symmetry breaking. The uh, the symmetries associated uh, with these sort of off-diagonal uh, gauge elements, they break, and the gauge bosons associated with these generators all become massive. They become too massive so, so that you can't uh, uh, observe them in experiment. And the only uh, un remaining unbroken symmetries will be this uh, standard model, uh, those corresponding to the standard model uh, uh, gauge group. Okay. Is, uh, I should ask, is, is this going too, too quickly? I, I'm trying to give a, a very general picture for, for everyone uh, rather than looking at the details. Is, is, is this being uh, absorbed or is this far too quick? Okay, I, I didn't hear anything. I'm going to assume that it's okay, and then I'm going to continue on. But please, if I'm going too quick, um, I realize this is a bit of a cartoon picture of things. If I'm going too quick, uh, please, please stop me, because I'm hoping that, that you're sort of following at least the flavor of what's going on here. Okay, so, <clears throat> okay, so, so we, we see from, from the Dinkin diagrams that we can find uh, we can find um, an uh, uh, the standard model gauge group as a subgroup of SU5. And we can find an appropriate uh, representation for a Higgs field such that you, you obtain this breaking. I haven't described any of the, the dynamics uh, for this model yet. But at least at uh, the level of uh, group theory, things seem to be plausible that you could construct such a model. So the next thing we want to do is we want to add in fermionic matter. So, so we've added in a, an adjoint representation uh, of the Higgs. So let's let's see if we can add in uh, some representation, some fermions that sit in appropriate representations. Right, so the smallest non-trivial representation of the Higgs is the five-dimensional representation. And let's consider the anti-fundamental uh, representation, right? The, the anti-five-dimensional representation. So. Um, the, the, the five-dimensional representation uh, uh, transforms in, in the usual way. You imagine this as a five-dimensional vector uh, where, 
which under a transformation just has unitaries acting on it, right? five by five uh, unitaries acting on it. So the, the anti-fundamental is just, it transforms as, as follows, where, where the star is the complex conjugate. Right? And, and which, which you define to be the fundamental and which you define to be anti-fundamental is just convention. But once you, once you select uh, a convention, you should stick with it. Right? So let's take a, uh, a spinner field which transforms in the five-dimensional representation underneath SU5. Where u here is 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 uh, the exponential of some algebra element, some Lie algebra element. Right. So so underneath SU SU five, our five dimensional representation uh, uh, transforms as follows. But what happens after symmetry breaking? Well, after symmetry breaking, this five dimensional re representation breaks up into a three dimensional anti uh, fundamental representation with charge one third and uh, a two-dimensional representation under SU2 uh, with a charge minus half, with hypercharge minus a half. Okay, so, so what, what does this mean? What does this notation mean? This is fairly standard notation. What it means is the following. Our, our five-dimensional representation, our anti-fundamental representation underneath SU2 breaks down into uh, an element which transforms as a three underneath SU3, and a one underneath uh, SU2 and has hypercharge uh, a third. Then there's also uh, elements that transform as a singlet underneath SU3 and a doublet underneath SU2 with charge uh, minus a half. So how do, how, do, how do I get this breakup? Well, if you look at the form of the generators of the subalgebra, uh, our you can write out our um, you can write out our spinner field as a five as a five vector, right? And so, so you can see that this five vector, uh, that the first three elements are going to transform as a three-dimensional representation underneath this uh, this the generators of SU three, right? whereas the bottom two elements will, will be completely invariant underneath the action of, of, of these uh, matrix algebras, uh, these matrix elements. Whereas the bottom two elements will be will act underneath the action of, of, of these SU2 generators. And, and, and the, the top three elements and the bottom two elements will, will both uh, be charged underneath this, this U1 generator, and they'll have different charges depending on the, the, uh, the entries of, of this diagonal matrix. Right. So this is, this is how you see uh, the breakup of the five-dimensional representation underneath this, this sub. Okay, so, so we see that the five, the anti-fundamental representation uh, breaks up in, in this way. So we can add these elements uh, into our table. So if we have a, a, an SU5 uh, grand unified theory with uh, you know, this, this anti-fundamental uh, uh, spinner field appearing in, in five star, then after symmetry breaking, it breaks up in the following uh, way. Now, one thing I need to tell you about is in, in the in the grand unified theory, uh, any of these fields will have to have a certain chirality. So if this is, if this is a left-handed field, um, then when it, when it goes through symmetry breaking, it has to break up into left-handed fields. The the breaking won't change the chirality uh, of the fields. Right? So under this breakup, the the components will also be uh, left-handed. And so I know that. All, both of these elements here, this element here, which I've suggestively named DRC and, L, and LL, have to be left-handed fields. Right? But if we have a look at the uh, charges, this, this transforms as a singlet. And we know in the standard model that all left-handed fields uh, transform as doublets. Right? So what, what does this C mean? This is the charge conjugate. So this is an antiparticle. You can think of this as an antiparticle. In our, in our labeling of all the particles in the standard model, we only included uh, particles. We didn't include the antiparticles. Right? But we could have extended this table to also include uh, their charge conjugates. So um, in, in this tabulation here, we're including both uh, left-handed particles and uh, currently right left-handed antiparticles. So this is right-handed antiparticles, which uh, left chiral. Okay. 
Okay, so so later I'll, I'll compare these values here uh, to the previous table uh, in a second, but it's obvious that there is not enough particle content here to correspond to the standard model. Okay, there's, there's only five particles here, five particle states here, whereas the standard model has, has much, much more. So let's continue. So what we can do is we can next introduce a spin in a field that uh, sits in the next largest dimen uh, dimensional representation of SU5. So we can in introduce the 10 dimensional representation, uh, a field in the 10 dimensional representation underneath SU5. Right. Now the 10 dimensional representation, you can express it as five by five matrices with complex entries, uh, which are anti-symmetric. Uh, Right. So if you do the counting, this is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So this corresponds to the uh, representation of a field in the 10-dimensional ten, ten representation of SU5. Right. So you can, you can think of these as spinner, as 5 by 5 matrix-valued uh, spinner fields. Okay, under a, a gauge transformation, the 10-dimensional the uh, representation transforms as follows where T here is the transpose. Right? So if we expand out uh, uh, these unitary uh, operators uh, as a, a matrix exponential, uh, a series expansion, then we'll find that they transform in the following way, right? plus higher order terms. Now, what you can do is you can check, and what you'll find, it, 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 you, you can go ahead and do this, this calculation for yourself, and you'll find that these three elements here transform uh, into one another as, a, as the anti-fundamental uh, representation of SU3. These three elements here transform as a triplet underneath SU3. Right? So SU3 tr transforms this element into this element, and this element into this element, and so on. And these elements here act as a doublet. Right? So the breakup of the particle content uh, is these three elements up here uh, form a triplet. These, these six elements here form an SU2 doublet and an SU3 triplet. And these elements here act as a singlet under both SU3 and SU2. And I, so I've, I've written down uh, the particle, particle content here of, of this breaking underneath the symmetry group as it undergoes uh, breaking. And so we can add this content into our, our table, our particle table. Shane, I'm a bit lost here. You know, just uh, tell me, means uh, you have introduced in the previous slide shy c is equal to sigma two shy l star and the thing. And uh, yeah, that's uh, shy star. So this is a charge conjugate. On the other hand, in the previous table, you just uh, took the star without the sigma two, and that also you denoted. As an antiparticle, when you introduce the anti fundamental representation. So, means generally, charge conjugation should be complex conjugation preceded by some unitary transformation, is not it? Yeah, so, so what I mean is the following. So, I'll have to draw this up. Sorry, it's it's probably not so clear. Can, can you see my screen? Can you see this paint uh, window? Is, is this visible? It's visible. Okay, good. So, if you so you can write so if you have some spinner field psi, right? You can write a basis of gamma matrices acting on that psi, which is completely off diagonal. This is the vial basis, right? Right. This is the vial basis. <laughs> it's it's not as fun doing talks without a proper blackboard, but we'll see if we can get this to work. So, so this this is our, our this is the form that our gamma matrices take, and if you have a look at the form that the uh, the special orthogonal transformations take, this, you can write their generators in terms of pairs of uh, gamma matrices, right? Okay. Sorry, this is, this is really uh, 
a bit funny. <laughs> I hope this is legible. Right? And so what you'll see is the, these generators of, of SO3, comma 1, they're always going to be uh, in some diagonal, block diagonal form. Right? Right? So they'll, they'll always be in some block diagonal form. Right? And so you can break up your, your spinner field right, into two components. Right? And you say that one of them transforms as a left-handed field, and one of them transforms as a right-handed field. Right? Underneath uh, the, the SO3, 1 transformations. Now it turns out that you can write if, if you write out um, your Dirac equation, or you look at the trans, if you look at the transformations of the left-hand fields underneath uh, SO3, comma one transformations, and you look at the transformations of the right-handed uh, components underneath the um, uh, uh, SO3, comma one transformations, then what you find is that sigma two psi left star where star is the complex conjugation, these, these transform exactly like a right-handed field. And similarly, sigma two psi r star transforms as a left-handed field. And, and so this, this, is the, this is how you define the charge conjugate of, of a vial spinner, right? And the point is that when we write out our so our standard model here, up here, we've, we've expressed our fields in terms of left-handed and right-handed fields. But if we wanted to, we could express uh, every, every field here as a left-handed field. We, we could just uh, include in this, in this table uh, these, the charge conjugates of all of these fields. Then the entire table would be left-handed. Right? And so we, we could have a, a larger table that includes all of the uh, particles that are left-handed, all the particles that are right-handed, as well as all the the antiparticles that are left-handed and all the antiparticles that are right-handed. I've only I've only included the particles here. And so what I'm saying is the following. In, in, so this this uh, if if your if your particle uh, transforms in the fundamental representation then the charge conjugate of that particle will transform in the anti-fundamental uh, representation. And you'll have opposite charges underneath U1 symmetry. So, so, here, so here, this is, you know, if, if you look in your table, so this is, uh, this, this particle here, DRC, it transforms as a triplet underneath SU3, a singlet underneath SU2, and it has charge uh, one third. So if you can remember those numbers, if we look back, so we're looking for three, one, and a third here. So here we have three, one, and minus a third, right? This is for the down right particle. And the point is the charge conjugate will pick up, uh, will have the opposite sign charge because it transforms in the anti-fundamental rather than the fundamental. Um, this is a little bit con uh, confusing uh, for, for someone, uh, if, for those who haven't had any um, uh, field theory experience. Uh, so, so I was a little bit hesitant to talk about uh, this in this talk because I realize I've got to cover a lot of material and that's why I'm trying to do it in sort of a big cartoony form. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it will transform into through anti fundamental representation. Yes. Yeah, that, that that's okay. There's another point I just wanted to go to the last slide which you displayed. The last uh, slide. This one? No, after that I think. This one? No, no. I think you have uh, okay, uh before you, uh, okay, one slide back. This one here? Yeah, uh, yeah. So now the spinner field, 
uh, when you write down this as a in the equation 45 i'm saying uh, so 45 yeah. is a the spinner is valued in su5 uh, in the is linear algebra or what shy 10 is valued in su5 linear algebra okay so so you can you can so shy 10 is a spinner field and its value it 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 it, it, it appears as a 10 dimensional representation of uh of SU5. So, so to be clear, so this 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 five-dimensional representation spinner field, this is a spinner field that you can think of as a five vector everywhere in space-time, right? And and it transforms in the anti-fundamental representation of SU5 locally. This this shy 10, you can think of it as a five by five matrix everywhere in space-time, uh, which is anti-symmetric. So, so you can think of this as a five by five uh, anti-symmetric uh, valued matrix uh, spinner field. So at every point in space time, it will take this this form. When you write down the exterior algebra for this uh, uh, lambda of uh, C5, which term does it uh, belongs to? The exterior algebra. Actually, yes. C you have to consider the action of SU5 on C5 now to begin with. On, and on then, uh, extra, and yes. then you construct the representation by considering the exterior algebra of C5. C5, oh, yeah. C5 and the lambda 1 C5, yes. lambda 2 C5, things like that. Yes, so, so that's, that's, one, that's one way of seeing, seeing things. So, so uh, so I was trying to, to do this without having to resort to the exterior algebra. So this is why I gave these representations here. So, so the, here I've got my, my uh, psi 5, and it sits in the anti-fundamental. And that means under a gauge transformation, it transforms just like this. Right? And, and you can, and so now I have my 10-dimensional representation. Right? And it transforms like this. So you can literally think of it as a 10 by uh, 5 by 5 matrix, which transforms by being sandwiched by the unitaries, where this is the transpose. So it's the same. So, so this is how the you can think of the adjoint representation, where uh, phi 24 is just a 5 by 5 matrix, and it transforms in the following way. Right? This, is the, this is the 5, this is the adjoint representation. Fundamental, the anti-fundamental transforms like this, and the 10 transforms like this. Now, you, you can express the 10 neatly in terms of uh, the exterior algebra of, of the 5, right? You, you, can take the, you can take the 5 dimensional representation and, and tensor it with another 5 and look at symmetric and anti-symmetric uh, combinations. I, I believe this is the I think this is the anti-symmetric combination, but I'm just writing it down in, in matrix form because I, I feel that's an easier uh, way to see the representation for people who are not familiar with the exterior, um, uh, the exterior algebra. Is, is that what you wanted to know? Yeah. That's okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so in fact, this, this is all I wanted to, to show you uh, about this grand unified uh, theory today. So, so just just to summarize what I've done. So, we wanted to we wanted to find. So, actually, I should say that if you if you now uh, compare this table with a standard model uh, table, standard model content, it 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 uh, aligns exactly. Um, uh, or, yeah, it's exactly the, the particle content of the standard model. All right, so what we've done is the standard model has uh, all of these fields that, are, that appear in these funny representations uh, underneath uh, the gauge symmetries, and they have these charges that are unexplained. Now, what we've done is we've started off with some SU5 uh, particle theory, 
And we, we've started off with uh, fields in the five, that's any fundamental representation and the 10 dimensional representation. We can also always add a singlet and under the breaking this will remain a singlet. Um, and what we find is under symmetry breaking, these representations break into exactly the representations for the standard model, including the correct hypercharges. So that, that's, that's, that's the main idea. Okay. Now, it turns out that uh, in recent years, SU5 is disfavored by experiment. It, it's really amazing that you can find the correct uh, group theory representations in SU5 for the standard model. But unfortunately, uh, the SU5 model is now ruled out by experiment. And one of the reasons why is, is as follows. I told you that there are these off-diagonal ge generators, right? We have these generators here that correspond to the standard model uh, gauge group generators. But then there are these additional uh, generators, the, this is additional 12 generators. Now, uh, after symmetry breaking, these acquire mass. And, and if you do the symmetry breaking, if you tune it in the right way, these will be so massive that you don't expect to see them in experiment. But they're still there. Right? And what these particle, what these uh, these heavy gauge bosons will do, is they couple between leptons and fermions and, and, and quarks. Right? They 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 have these off diagonal terms will couple between leptons and quarks, and ultimately result in proton decay. And so, uh, if you go away and do an experiment, people have you find that the proton is stable, and uh, there are now bounds on that stability. There are stability bounds which rule out. Uh, the simplest SU5 models. So, although SU5 is very beautiful as a grand unified theory, it, it's, it's now no longer seen as being really realistic. And, and so what you can do is you can look at alternatives. So one of the nicest alternatives, uh, we, you can go ahead and look at the larger groups which can contain the standard model. And one of the nicer alternatives is the SO10 model. Right? So here I have the extended Dinkin diagram for SO10. Uh, and, and we can see if we, we cross out this uh, 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 root here, what we end up with is the Dinkin diagram for SU4 cross U2 cross U2. We can then do a, a second breaking and break down to SU3 cross uh, SU2 cross U1 cross U1. So this is the, the standard model of particle physics extended by an additional U1 symmetry. And, and this, this breaking is still viable as far, far as I'm aware. Okay, so uh, th there are lots of other interesting possibilities. And now that you have access to uh, Dinkin diagrams, you can go uh, do some exploring of your own and, and see uh, sort of uh, what gauge groups you can find which contain the standard model of particle physics gauge group. Um, and so th that's all I wanted to say about uh, uh, grand unified theories today. Uh, I'm sorry that was a, a very sort of a, a very zoomed out uh, overview uh, without much of the details, but I, I hope uh, you, you got a feel for uh, uh, how they work in any case. I just wanted to mention uh, one more thing. So in in the last uh, in the first lecture I gave, there were, someone was asking why it is that gauge bosons sit in the adjoint representation, and I, I want to explain why that is uh, just very quickly now uh, to answer that question. And uh, it's for the following reason. Consider you have some field that transforms, uh, let's say it's in the fundamental representation, it transforms uh, uh, as follows uh, underneath uh, some gauge group, some local gauge group. Right? If we take the derivative of this field, right, this derivative will not transform correctly under this gauge symmetry, right? Because the derivative does not commute uh, with u, where u uh, takes on this form, right? Because the coefficients here depend on space, right? So uh, the way the, the, the variation of the field in space time does not transform uh, correctly underneath uh, a gauge transformation, okay? And, and so the solution is you replace your, your partial derivative with a covariant derivative, a gauge covariant derivative. So you add in some, uh, some field A mu, and you ask that it transforms in a special way underneath the gauge transformation. Right? You have some inhomogeneous gauge transformation. And if A transforms in just the appropriate way, 
then what you find is that the covariant derivative of the field does transform correctly underneath the gauge transformation. Right? So you, you, you add in, you, you, you use the, the covariant derivative rather than the uh, partial derivative to ensure that your field, your, the, your derivative of your field transforms covariantly with respect to uh, the gauge transformations. But notice that A is just a new field that we've added into our theory. In fact, this is, a, this is exactly how the gauge bosons arise in, in a field theory. Right? These are our force carrying particles that are associated to this symmetry. Okay, so notice that if we, we can look at how this uh, transformation, uh, you can look at this transformation infinitesimally, right? And, and, and when we do that, it takes the following form. Now, on the right-hand side, we have the derivative of some coefficient contracted on some gauge generator, okay? because this C takes the following form. So we, we see that our, our gauge field transforms as follows, where on the right-hand side, we have something uh, in the form uh, that takes on the form of the gauge generators. Right? And we know that the gauge generators, or the, the generators of our symmetry, right, the elements of our Lie algebra, uh, sit in the adjoint representation. Right? So, because they sit in the rep, uh, adjoint representation, it means that the uh, the gauge bosons also have to, right? Because the you know the, the gauge bosons have to take on the same uh, form as, as 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 they do in this expression, right? And so so that's the reason why uh, the gauge bosons uh, are said to uh, appear in the adjoint representation right? because they have to transform uh, in in this way here. So so unlike Unlike the fermions and, and scalar fields, there are group theory restrictions on the representations of the gauge bosons. Okay. Um, in any case, that's all I wanted to say uh, in, in my final lecture. I hope that was somewhat understandable to some people in the uh, audience. I hope I didn't lose too many people. Um, but does anyone have any questions? Professor? Uh, yes? Uh, in defining the covariant derivative, uh, we, we, we defined it uh, uh, as d mu plus igd, d mu plus gw. I mean, for different representations, d mu should be different, right? But in uh, the first place in Lagrange, Lagrangian, you wrote the same covariant derivative for the, the doublet part, left-handed leptons and the right-handed electrons. Why is that? I mean, for the right-handed electron, the covariant derivative should not be equal to the left-handed lepton doublet, right? That's exactly right. So this- but why, this, why the, these two are the same, how these two are the same here? Yeah, so, so that's exactly right. So, so the way, so you're talking about these terms here, is that correct? Yes, 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 these two terms, last two terms. Yeah, so, so what I mean by that, so, so here, so sorry, this is going to be a little bit messy again, uh, but that's a good question. So here, where I have D slash acting on psi R, Right. So what this is, you can read this as well. Really, this is a uh, uh, sorry. I'm bastardizing the notation a little bit because this is a four-dimensional object and these are vital spinners. But um, what I mean is the following. So the right-handed particles only transform underneath uh, U1. So here you only have a U1 a generator. So as not to, right? Whereas acting on the left-handed fields, right? 
you have some additional terms. So here's your charge thing. Sorry, this is very messy. Um, right, so the point is, so schem schematically, so, so th this looks like it's the same covariant derivative acting on the left and the right-handed fields, it's actually not. So what I mean by this is, so th this term here, where, which is acting on a left-handed field, right? Uh, you'll have an additional term in the covariant derivative. You'll have this additional SU2 connection part, whereas this term over here will not, right? Because it's a right-handed field. Right, so it, it's it's it the the covariant the covariant derivative acting on a field will depend on the, the symmetries that that field transforms under. And so I, I, I write them all in the same notation here. Is that an answer to your question? Okay, but I mean, they are not the same, but I am writing it in the same notation, right? And well, well, so, so th this means... I mean, So, so, so the, the covariant derivative acting on some object will depend on what symmetries that object uh, transform under. So, so if, if, so, so in other words, um, uh, here, the, the, the Higgs field transforms under a, a, um, an SU2 as well as a U1 symmetry, and so the gate, the covariant derivative uh, is is written in the same notation, but acting on the Higgs field, it'll have these additional connection terms. If you were acting on a field that had uh, SU3 symmetry, you'd have to include uh, generators for the SU3 symmetry as well. So it depends on the object that your covariant derivative is acting on, what terms are included. Okay. Okay. Can I request another thing, Professor? Can yeah, you sure. sure. Just repeat, can you just please repeat the last uh, argument you gave that why the bosonic part sit on the adjoint representation? The bonus part sure. you were talking about. I, I just missed the last argument. Sure, no worries. So, so here we have a... a so here we have some matter field. It could be anything. It could be a scalar field or a fermion. And let's imagine that it transforms underneath uh, the fundamental representation. So un underneath a gauge transformation, psi goes to u psi, right? where u takes uh, the usual form. Right? Now, what we want to do is, is we want to look at derivatives of, of this field. And we want derivatives of this field to transform the same way as the field does underneath a gauge transformation. Now, so under a gauge transformation, uh, the partial derivative of psi transforms as, as follows, right? Because psi transforms as follows. But u does this, 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 uh, this uh, group element does not commute with the partial derivative because it, it, it's, spat it's spatially dependent. And so, this equality here does not hold. So in other words, uh, under a gauge transformation, the partial derivative of the side doesn't transform in, in the same way as, as the, the field itself does. Right? Now the idea is we replace the partial derivative with a, a gauge covariant derivative by adding in a field. Right? And this, this field is the gauge boson right? associated uh, with, with the symmetry group that we're looking at. And you have to ask the gauge, the, the, this field transform um, uh, in, in a special way. And if you ask that it transforms in this way, 
uh, the the, cover, the gauge covariant derivative uh, of, the, of the field will then correct, uh, correctly transform underneath the gauge uh, transformation. Right. And, and you should go away and convince yourself uh, of this fact. Actually, but, uh, convince yourself that if if you if you uh, ask that a transform in the appropriate way, that the covariant derivative of psi will in, indeed transform in the appropriate uh, manner. Now, so 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 our a mu's are our gauge bosons, and they transform in this way underneath the gauge symmetry, right? But what we can do is we can we can write out these exponentials. Uh, is a series expansion. Right? We can write this as 1 minus c plus half c squared and so on. And when we do that, and we focus on just the first terms, or, or in other words, we look at uh, infinitesimal transformations which are close to the identity, right, where c is really small, then, then a transforms in the, in the following manner. So a goes to a mu plus uh, c commuted with a mu, minus uh, partial derivative of mu acting on c. And if we include higher order terms, this will just have some higher order terms, which are all nested commutators. Now, c here takes the following form. c is some, some spatially dependent coefficient contracted on a gauge generator. Right? This is an element of our Lie algebra. Right? So, in other words, the, these a's have to take on the same form as, as, the, as the generating elements of our uh, Lie algebra. Because on, on this side of the equation, we have our ti's sitting in here. So in other words, a has to take on the same form as the generators because it transforms like these generators. And, and uh, the simplest thing you can have is uh, a sitting in the adjoint representation of the gauge symmetry um, uh, and then this equation will make sense. Right? This is just the adjoint action of C on A, and then, so, 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 so yeah, th this action of C on A is the adjoint action, and uh, uh, this element here sits in the adjoint representation. And so, so this is the argument for why uh, the, the gauge bosons themselves should sit in the adjoint representation, because of how they transform. Uh, does that answer the question? Yes. I, I, I get it now. Thank you so much. No worries. So, so you'll see that so there's, no, there's no analogous uh, argument that you can make for the other particles. So the scalar fields and, and the fermions really can have any representations. Right? So, so really, they could have any representations. And, and it's really confusing. Why is it that they have these representations here? We, we don't know. And so the whole idea is of these gauge, uh, these grand unified theories is we start with some large group with a certain representation, and then we uh, we see whether we can we can once we break that um, symmetry group down whether we can obtain uh, the representations that we see in experiment. And indeed, that's what you get from SU five, and uh, it's really remarkable that uh, SU five doesn't work because it, it's really beautiful that you can. You can uh, find the center model uh, gate, uh, representations uh, through this breaking of, of the smallest uh, representations of SU5. Thank you. Thank you very much. Does anyone have any further questions? The same, so last uh, thing you mentioned at the point, uh, last point that SU5 has been ruled out experimentally because it indicates some sort of coupling between the leptons and the quarks, which has not been yes. observed experimentally. But uh, can one say that it is still open? So far it has not been observed or it has already been ruled out? So. For, re for realistic, as far as I'm aware, uh, the, the bounds on on proton decay are extremely stringent now. Like it, uh, they're on the order of I, I don't know what it is, but it's like billions of years. It's like a, 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 older than the age of the universe, uh, as far as I'm uh, as I remember. Don't quote me on that one though. But so the 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 the, re the restrictions are stringent enough. Um, that realistic versions of uh, the SU5 model are, are ruled out, as far as I'm aware. 
where does this Patisala model stand in contrast to this? Thing? So the the reason why the Paddy Salam so uh, the reason is the following. Uh, if you if you look up here at the form of the generators, right? So so imagine here. So so let's look down at this uh, at the five dimensional representation again. Right? So the anti fundamental representation is some five vector. Right? Now um, imagine you have these generate. These are the generators of the sub algebra. And imagine they're acting on that five vector, right? And, and you can break up the five vector into the top three components. Go draw it like this. So we, we have our SU3 generators, which are of this form. They sit up here, right? And under the action of, of, of the SU3 generators, uh, the, these three elements here transform as a triplet, and these, these guys are, are uncharged, so they, they, they will act as a singlet. Under the SU2 generators, right, which are down here, these three elements up here act as a singlet, and, and these two elements here act as a doublet. All right, so this is the way that these generators work. So these are the generators associated uh, uh, with the uh, SU3 plus SU2 plus U1 uh, subalgebra. But then you've got these additional generators, right? So th these, these are off-diagonal generators. All right, so they're of this form. They're off diagonal. Right. Right. So the idea is so when this generator acts, it, it maps, you know, between these two pairs of particles. Right. So so the, the generators of the subgroup leave these these are quarks here and these are leptons. So the, the generators of the of the of the, of the center model uh, gauge group leave uh, quarks and 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 uh, leptons separately. They're separate. They don't they don't map between quarks and leptons. Whereas SU five has some additional generators, right, some additional generators, and these generators here map you between quarks and leptons, right? And and so protons are constructed from quarks. And so if you have a proton built of quarks and you have some something that can couple between quarks and leptons, then what can happen is these generators can leave, lead to disintegration of, of, of the proton, right? Because the, the quarks that make up the proton will disintegrate into leptons and maybe some radiation, right? So, so that's what happens in SU5. Okay. Now, Paddy Salam is different. Okay. Paddy Salam as the gauge group SU4 cross SU2 cross SU2. Right. So where are we? Uh, how do I draw this? So SU2 cross it. So So the, this, the gauge group here is SU2 cross SU2 cross SU2. And let's, let's focus on just this SU4 part. Right, so so the, the way this, this, well, let me say it like this. This SU2 acts on the left-handed particles, and this acts on the right-handed particles. The only part that you could, you could run into troubles with is this SU4 part. Because SU4, you can think of as, as being the generators of being four by four matrices, right? And they act on the quarks and leptons as follows. So here's the leptons and the quarks, right? right? And this is the SU, the SU4 generators take the following form. Um, I, I should just find some generators so I, so I can show you. But the, the point is the, the when, when you do 
So I'm not explaining this very well, but, but basically what, what happens is it is true, it is true that uh, as, as part of SU4, there are generators that will map you between leptons and quarks. But there's something very special about this breaking. So, so this breaking, if you look at it, when you go from SU, from Paddy Salam down to the standard model, you get the standard model gauge group plus this additional U1. And this additional U1 is important, right? right? It takes the following form. So you have uh, minus uh, 3, 1, 1, 1, right? Now, now, this is the gauge B minus L symmetry, right? This, this, this is the generator of, of what's called B minus L symmetry. And so baryon minus lepton number is a, is a symmetry of this breaking, right? And, and that symmetry preserves quarks and leptons, right? It, it preserves the baryon uh, minus lepton number. And, and, and so uh, but because, because this breaking preserves B minus L symmetry, uh, is, is precisely the reason uh, why uh, uh, quarks and, and leptons don't transform into one another. They're, they're protected by this uh, local symmetry. Uh, was, was that clear? Yeah, it is clear. Uh, Excuse me. Uh, uh, is there any connection between the SO10 where they treat both fermions and bosons on equal footing and the supersymmetric models? Oh, um, so, uh, you mean supersymmetric uh, SO10 models? Yes. yes. Um, I, I'm sorry. I, I'm not. I, I. I don't. I don't know enough about that. A anything I say about that would be. Uh, probably not correct. So I, I'm sorry, I can't answer that question. I apologize. Okay, okay. Okay. Does anyone have uh, Shumit Vishesh, any other question you may have? No, no feel free to ask. <laughs> I, I have asked so many questions and uh, the things. It's okay, okay, you ask another one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It was really nice, Professor. I mean, uh, I, I am. I have started reading standard model and uh, there are lots of questions in my mind and your lecture like this question that uh, why do bosons uh, follow their gentry presentations and why then sometimes it's like that I don't get what to question because uh, most of, many of the facts are experimental facts. Mm -hmm. so, it will be very helpful if you can suggest that uh, how to proceed. I mean, uh, uh, I was engaged questioning that why do the fundamental particles uh, uh, follow the this kind of representation? Then I got the fact that okay, they are from observation, and uh, I should not question that. Then exactly after that, I was not questioning that why the gaze boson. Are following this kind of representation, but uh, it actually comes from, uh, as you showed, that the uh, gauge field and the field transformation, and uh, from the transformation property, I can get that it is easiest to see the adjunct in the adjunct representation for the gauge boson parts. So, uh, if you short guideline that uh, how should I proceed or uh, or from where I can solve problems so that I, I, I can do better 
in standard model and particle physics it will be very helpful for me and for us i think also um so so your question is uh what sort of literature you should you should yes. read is, is, is yes uh, the literature i should follow the process it should be helpful if you say oh. some words in that. um uh if if you want to learn for example about uh grand unified theories in particular um and, and that approach to the standard model there is a very nice but rather long text uh by uh someone called slansky uh there's a text called group theory for unified model building i found that very helpful so so that that will give you uh, a very nice introduction to essentially that will give you all the information that I've, I've uh, covered in in my three lectures um, in in various forms so if you're interested in in the group can, 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 you, can you uh, tell me again which book you said so so this is a book called uh, group theory for unified model building by R. Slansky. So Slansky is spelled S-L-A-N-S-K-Y. Uh, it's a very nice review. It's quite old now, but it's it's a it's a very nice review of uh, grand unified theories and uh, Dinkin diagrams. I think they, they also show you how to find representations. It, it's 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 quite nice. But at the start of that book, they also give an introduction to the standard model. Uh, of particle physics, which might be uh, useful as well. Um, what else is quite useful? Uh, so I, I learned particle theory from a very strange direction because my background is in uh, non commutative geometry. So a lot of the texts that I used uh, to learn the center model uh, are not really appropriate. Um, let me think. You know, another another paper that is really beautiful uh, that I'd recommend you read is um, uh, this is again in the direction of grand unified theories. So the, the SU5 model that I uh, discussed is called the Georgie Glashow model. And the original paper by Georgie and Glashow is really beautiful. It's, it's, it's uh, very short. It's like five pa pages and it's very easy to read. And and uh, it, it's it's uh, you know it's one of those classic papers that everyone who's interested in particle theory should read at some point. It's 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 really an excellent paper. Um, I, I highly recommend if you're interested in grand unified theories, you go and read the original uh, uh, paper on on grand uh, on the SU five model. It's 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 very very nice. Um, then the 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 only thing I can recommend uh, is. I, 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 if I was you, I would read um, the the uh, textbook by uh, Peskin and Schroeder. Uh, Pesk Peskin and Schroeder have a very nice quantum field theory book that that I find uh, really really nice. Um, and then there's a nice uh, uh, set of notes from the mathematical tripos uh, at Cambridge written by, um, I'm forgetting the name. If you send me an email, I'll send you a small list of some, some very approachable, um, oh, David Tong. So David Tong has a very nice set of lectures which are very introductory level uh, for quantum field theory uh, that, I, that I recommend you, you, you check out. So, so if you have a look, look at those four or five references I just mentioned, um, uh, th that would be a nice start, I think. Thank you, Professor. Uh, I have a small question, I, and it's not directly related to today's talk. So, would you mind if I ask? Uh, sorry? It's not directly related to today's talk. So, would you mind if I ask the question? Yeah, yeah, you ask question. All right. So, it's about vacuum energy density. 
Now, in one of the papers I came across, they were trying to estimate the uh, energy density contribution from Higgs field. Now, in the approach they used, they considered a Higgs potential with a single complex scalar field. But I know that Higgs field is a doublet with four degrees of freedom. But they did proceed with this complex field to find the energy density. And I'm confused how this is valid. Like, will considering such a field guarantee that I uh, have a symmetry of the Lagrangian, which is not shared by the vacuum state? Can I comment on this? Uh, sorry, could you answer the question? Uh, ask the question again. I, I, I just, I may, maybe a little bit slower. Oh, all right, all right. Uh, so uh, it's about vacuum energy density. Yes. And then one of the papers I came across, they were trying to estimate the energy density contribution from the Higgs field. Mm -hmm. Now, in the approach they used, they considered a Higgs potential with a single complex scalar field. Okay. But I know that Higgs field is a doublet with four degrees of freedom. Now, mm -hmm. they did proceed with this uh, single complex field to find the vacuum energy density. And I'm confused how this is valid. Like, will considering such a field guarantee that I have a symmetry of the Lagrangian, which is not shared by the vacuum state? So your your question is um, you you so, you see. So basically, so the you, paper proceed with a single complex scalar field, Higgs field. Yeah, and and you're 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 wondering if it's it's valid uh, uh -huh. to to take that as an approximation. Right. right. Um, I, I the answer is I don't know. I would have to actually have a look at the details of the paper. Um, now, the the actual physical Higgs field that you you see in experiment um, is is an object that you get after symmetry. Well, the the, the answer is I, I I don't know unless I see uh, the actual explicit calculations that they did. Um, it it may very well be valid depending on on what they did. Um, uh, I, I'm sorry. I. I could could you send me the paper and, and maybe I could have a look over yeah, it? Yeah, sorry, I could do that. I could do that. Um, uh, do you? You? Uh, I'm I'm not sure who's speaking. If you have my email, um, uh, which you you can easily get off, uh, it's fine for the uh, uh, the organizers to give that to you. If you send it to me, I'll have a, I'll, I'll have a look through for you. Um, uh, but I I can't really answer that directly without uh, seeing what they did. All right, thank you. I'll send a mail then. Thank you. Hi, Professor. Uh, can you please tell where these group of uh, theory applications come up in uh, quantum optics areas? Oh, um, I can't tell you uh, about quantum optics because I don't know about uh, quantum optics. But um, uh, group theory comes up quite a lot in just regular uh, optics when you're dealing with lenses. Um, uh, um, you know, when, when you're looking at uh, uh, the various re reflection, refraction in, uh, angles, and, and so so what, so so forth. Um, but it's been a long time uh, since I've played around with that sort of thing in undergrad. Um, so I, I can't really give you a satisfactory, uh, satisfactory answer there because I'm I'm not uh, I don't have a strong enough background in, in uh, quantum optics. Sorry. Okay. No. Anyone else with any question? What about Raghun Nagarajan? Have any question, Raghun Nagarajan? Okay, then I think there is no further question. But we all thank yeah, Shane for very nice thank lectures. Yeah. yeah. So thank, thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much for the uh, invitation to speak. Uh, <laughs> right? It was. It,
it was a it was a pleasure to speak with you all. I, I uh, yeah, thank thank you. Uh, in case uh, you can manage time, uh, will it be possible for you to be there in the concluding part tomorrow? Uh, it, it depends. Uh, I have to look and see what time because yeah, I'm, I, will I'm actually, I will send you an invitation so you can check it there. And, yeah. yeah. I, I'm actually uh, tomorrow. I'm doing a certificate for scuba diving. So, <laughs> if, okay, if, okay. Uh, if if that's uh, not overlapping, then I'll I'll be there. Okay, 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 sure. So thank you so much for. for uh, I'm just thanking you from on behalf of the organizers that uh, it was very nice to get a chance to listen to you throughout these three lectures, and uh, yeah. Uh, the students, I could see from introductions that uh, they have also enjoyed well. So thank you so much for everything. Uh, and we break now for 20 minutes and we come back again at 6 o'clock. Thank you very much. Oh, I yeah. hope it was understandable. <laughs> ah, yeah, it was. Really very, it was. Good, very good shame. It was extremely nice. Miss. I also yeah. miss my very memory clear. of many of these things got rusted over the years. So I had the chance to recapitulate, which I probably will need now very soon, <laughs> as you understand. Well, I'll see you all uh, later. Have a, yeah, have yeah, a good one. yeah, 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 sure, sure, sure. Okay, then. Okay, bye. Thank you. See ya. Yeah. So, for the participants, so we'll come back again uh, 20 minutes later with Professor Latham's talk, which is last but one talk possibly of the whole workshop. So kindly make sure to be there. OK, see you in half an hour, uh, 20 minutes.
Hello, can you hear me? Yes, hello, hello, Archie. Okay, great. Professor? Yes. Uh, before starting today's lecture, can I ask something from the previous lecture? Yes, sure, sure. Uh, uh, in uh, constructing the uh, irreducible representations, uh, six irreducible representations, we uh, used QL, UR, DR, left handed, left on, right handed neutrino right-handed electron and Higgs field, right? Yes. In the in this representation, the right-handed neutrino and the right-handed neutrino star is exactly same irreducible representation. I mean, yes, C cross that's, C cross C that's, zero because charge the, charge zero and the make zero and the right star right-handed neutrino star is also charge zero. And yes, they both are simulated under SU3 and SU2. Then uh, how can I differentiate them by just looking their irreducible representation? Uh, in, in, that's a very good point. Uh, and in fact, that's, you're right, that that's the, that's the, that's the uh, special particle in the standard model where, where you can't. Um, and so uh, actually, so for example, when I, um, when I, uh, you know, just, just based, just based on their, um, uh, gauge representation, you, you can't, uh, now one lies in the, the, the right-handed neutrino lies in the zero one half representation of the Lorentz group. And its antiparticle lies in the one half zero representation of the Lorentz group. So, based on their so, so, uh, based on their full space time representation, they they do have a different represent. They do transform differently. But um, but you're right that when I I, uh, I don't know if this is what you were referring to, but there were some points. There there was a point where I was a little bit. Um, uh, there was, some, there was kind of a subtle point I didn't mention yesterday, which was I was saying that when you go to SU5, that the representations in those tables group into lambda C5, exterior algebra, where the left-handed uh, fermions of F all transform as the even forms in lambda C5 and the, and the other ones the remaining right-handed guys f star transform as the as the odd forms, but really that assumes that you put the right the right-handed neutrino you 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 identify it with the five form as opposed to the zero the zero form. But both of those are just the singlet representation of SU five. They're identical, so it's arbitrary. You could you could have done it either way. One way of doing it gives a neater interpretation. So presumably, if this is on, if this unification scheme is on the right track, presumably that's the right one. But um, but just based on the just based on the gauge group representation, it's it, there's that there is an ambiguity there uh, because like it, you're absolutely right, they have the same representation. And yeah, that's a good a good point. And there is another point I was confused about. I mean. Uh, in quark tablet or lepton tablet, in lepton tablet, I have got left-handed neutrino, right? Yes. And uh -huh. there is a right-handed neutrino star that all transforms like a left-handed neutrino, but they are in different representations, right? Yes. So, in taking uh, or calculating the dimension, I was just wondering if there is any overlapping between some kind of, or that the two neutrinos, both are left-handed, but one is in another representation and the other is in another representation. So can you say some words on that? It seems yeah. 
quite confusing to me. Yes. Well, okay. So the so indeed the neutrino sector of the standard model is by far the most confusing part. But let me say one one thing um uh which will just make it more confusing, I'm afraid, but uh but nevertheless should be said. I think I forgot to I, I don't I think I may have forgotten to say it actually uh in the earlier lectures, although I should have, which is that um you know I have been calling the standard model this table that includes the right-handed neutrino. Now, many people would refer to the standard model, and certainly before the discovery of neutrino masses in the late 90s, or before the confirmation of neutrino masses in the late 90s, um, 